Hey everyone, can you hear me? Perfect. So, did you have a good night's sleep, everyone? <laughs> That's what I thought, because if anyone had said yes, I would have said liars. Because I'm pretty sure after yesterday, you woke up during the night, had sweat all over your body and locations in my code. I need to vectorize everything. I need to benchmark everything. And, but we have a joke in, in Switzerland. We usually say, do you know how you can get 10x performance out of your applications and servers? Any guesses? Well, remove all the threat sleeps the previous developers introduced. That's what, that's what we do. That's how we do performance optimizations in Switzerland. So um, today I'm going to talk about async await, uh, .NET Core, and C Sharp 8, and how those two uh, things uh, play together. So maybe you don't know yet, but uh, C Sharp 8 and is basically only available with .NET Core 3.0, or let's say that's the official statement from Microsoft. But uh, if you dig a little bit deeper, it's actually not entirely true. So what you can use C Sharp uh, outside .NET Core. You can use it even uh, in uh, .NET Standard 2.0. But there are caveats. So not all features are officially supported. And Microsoft says, if you're willing to dig into the details what is supported and what is not supported, you can use C Sharp uh, with Net Standard as well. Um, but I'm not sure if you want to do it, but you can do it. But the things that I'm showing today, um, I'm showing them on their Net Core app uh, 3.0 only with, with a little bit of C Sharp. So one of the things that I do uh, in particular and I've done for, for many years is I wrote a lot of async and TPL uh, code and I've seen a lot of bad code. And whenever we also support multiple uh, thousands of customers worldwide, a lot of developers worldwide, and we get a lot of support requests from them as well because as a, as a vendor, it's usually when something goes wrong within the framework that they're using, they first contact the vendor and say, what the hell is your framework doing? And then you, you start digging deeper and then you find all sorts of nasty code and stuff that is not really according uh, to the standards. And one of the things that uh, we saw is, well, async await is basically here to stay and it's, it's going everywhere and it's extremely viral, right? It's like a highly infectious disease. Once you have it, it spreads all over your body and you're going to die. No, not, not that terrible, but <laughs> it's actually almost like that, right? So, and the thing is, many IO-bound library, what does IO-bound means is when you have HTTP requests, sockets, TCP, and all that stuff, they are now, nowadays, if they're modern implementations of their task-based, so they can be enabled to use um, ASIC await, and of course, if they use the latest and greatest features, for example, they also leverage the thing like called value task that they might cover or might not cover depending on, on, on the time. But then what I see is especially a lot of, I mean, it would be nice if we could write new code every day, shiny green grass development, right? But unfortunately, that's not how we can work every day. So we have things to maintain, and, but still, those things, those systems that we maintain, we pull in new libraries, and suddenly those libraries become async await, right? Uh, they return tasks. And then we are kind of forced with existing code that somehow needs to interrupt with uh, task returning APIs. And we're like, OK, what do we do now? Right? So we get in contact with that stuff. Well, the good thing is, if you're using something like um, ASP.NET MVC, even uh, the classic web API, um, or the new ASP.NET Core MVC or uh, web API, we have an entry point, which is, for example, the MVC controller. And the good thing is, those frameworks already allow us to return a task. Right? So we're in, we are in a good world that allows us to basically ripple through the virality of async await uh, to, to the higher call stack and we are fine. So, but then uh, we might have existing code that in, uh, integrates into Windows services or other things and then we might not be able to do that. And the topic that comes up, and it's the first topic, uh, is uh, this uh, sync over async, right? Because people say, well, I have reasons why I don't want to change everything or I'm lazy, I don't want to change everything or whatever your reason is. Um, they're saying, I'm just going to bridge the async API into a sync API and everything will be fine. Well, um, let me show you some code. 
um, before I get started. So I have here, hopefully you can read it, I have here a pretty simple um, async API and um, it has a run method and I have here a little helper method wrapped in context and I have here this blocks and potentially deadlocks kind of method. What this method does is it calls an async API, do async operation and that uh, one uh, does, after that it does get away to get result. Um, the developer who wrote this code was smart because that person knew that with get away to get result what's going to happen is we are getting actually the, the underlying exception that was raised and not, for example, an aggregate exception. So that's already good. It's a, it's a blocking call um, and it synchronizes the async operation. Let's have a quick look into uh, this, this operation, what it does. It does nothing more than just console write line await task delay of two Another console write line returns uh, the hello string, and uh, that's it. Then we do get a way to get result. So let's have a quick look at what happens when we execute this code. When we execute this code, this demo will forever run, right? So I could now leave the stage and say, I'm, I'm done with my presentation because my demos don't work. Well, what we have now is we have a deadlock. So why do we have a deadlock? Well, what, what happens uh, with this code here is, and how the async uh, stuff works is, we have a code that is executed under a thing called synchronization context. And um, the, the task schedule wraps that synchronization context, and what's going to happen with this code, we're saying, hey, please, do this async operation, and the thread enters here, and then it goes into the wait statement, goes up again, and then we say, and please, thread, uh, now you are blocked, right? You cannot do anything else. You have to synchronously wait for the, for the result of this uh, operation. And because async await state machine by default does a thing called context capturing, what it does, it basically says, well, if you're exiting and executing a continuation of an asynchronous method, what, uh, what does that mean? The continuation of an async method in, in this example is the console write line down here after the await. Uh, then please execute uh, this stuff on the thread that entered this method, right? But the thread that entered this method is blocked because we t tell it, hey, you have to wait for the operation. So now we have a deadlock. And of course, here in this example, uh, you can say, well, we can easily solve this problem. Any guesses how we could solve this problem? Configure await false, exactly. We could add uh, to, this, uh, to this method configure await false here, and then it would no longer, uh, it would no longer block. Because we're telling uh, the compiler generated state machine, hey, we don't want you to do this silly context capturing because we're knowing we want to be context free. Please stop doing uh, that crazy shit. And uh, then, ex then basically what, what can happen is the code or the continuation, which is the console write line, the return hel hello, can be executed on any other uh, thread pool uh, thread. And then this code uh, will no longer deadlock. So cool, nice. Um, let's, have a, let's have a quick look at, at another example. But then uh, there would be also uh, another, another thing that we can do. For example, uh, people get extremely creative if you Google on Stack Overflow. For example, they start writing code like this. Uh, they return a task, do a wait of 1,000 milliseconds, and then call get away to get result. This code also deadlocks, although it's a really creative way of writing the same stuff that has the same problems. <laughs> then you see people saying, well, if you don't want context capturing and you don't have control over configure await false because maybe it's a third-party library, then you can just uh, wrap it in a toss.run. Right. What it means is um, you're saying, please explicitly offload this to the, uh, to the worker thread pool. Um, well, that works. That will uh, eliminate the problem of this context capturing because inside the lambda of this task.run here, there is no context available. What, what's available there is the task scheduler.default unless someone messes uh, with evil minds with your task scheduler infrastructure. You can do that. You can ask Kevin Gosse. He has uh, done that to his uh, coworker, Chris, uh, Christian. Um, it will be executed on the task scheduler the default, which is not aware of the syn current synchronization context. So you could say, nice, now we solve this problem, I can use this pattern in my code as well. Well, not really, because what you now introduced is you introduced a threat starvation problem. Why did you introduce a threat starvation problem? I can quickly show 
<laughs> that uh, in my demo. So uh, let's let's unblock this one. Um, let's execute it. Dot net run, and let's see what happens. So we can we can we can see here we are on thread one here, and now if we execute this. Sync over async. What's going to happen is we we enter the sync context uh, uh, on thread four. We do the async uh, operation uh, on thread five, and then we come back on uh, sync context uh, thread four. What it means here is essentially the thread that that enters into that method is blocked, right? So it has to wait. But then in order to kick off the continuation, we need another thread to wake up uh, the continuation. And then, essentially, what we did here is we now are using two threads. A synchronous method that would have a thread sleep in there for two milliseconds would only block one thread. But the asynchronous thing that we introduced with the task.run now uses two threads. And now, of course, if we have this kind of code in our application that gets executed hundreds and hundreds of times, millions of times in our server environments, we're essentially using the double amount of threads, and therefore we introduce threats, uh, thread starvation problems. Why is there thread starvation problems? Well, as, as you might have heard, the worker thread pool sort of has a limited capacity, and what it does, it does a so-called hill climbing algorithm, and it continuously ramps up the capacity. So the more pressure you put on the worker thread pool, the more, basically, uh, threads it, it, uh, it allocates for you, the more memory it uses, um, but it has a limited capacity and that ramping up and that memory usage and everything, it takes time. And at some point, you're going to reach I its limits. That's also depending on uh, the, the bitness so that you compile against. But you're going to uh, hit that limit and then your application basically stops working. And of course, by doing that kind of pattern, um, you're uh, twice as more likely to get into that problem. So the morale of this story is, um, what you should do in your code is, whenever you can and you have async APIs, embrace the reality of those async APIs and basically ripple the async task, async task up to the highest level, to the entry point. And if the framework that you're using, if you get called by a framework, then leverage the async nature of the framework if it has it uh, uh, for you, or only ever do the tasks that run on the highest level of your code because that, that's where you are in control and you know how many times it's going to get called. You can bundle things together and you, ha you have control uh, on um, ho how many threads you're going to be using. So that's, that, that's uh, one, uh, one way uh, to do it. But I encourage you, uh, do not fall into the trap of going sync over async because it's going to hurt hurt the performance uh, of your software, embrace the virality of, uh, of the async APIs. So now, if you're in this world where we're saying, we want to be good async citizens, we want to do uh, whatever the book writes, whatever uh, Daniel, the Swiss guy, told you, um, then we actually have to think about what is actually a good async API? Well, there are a number of things you have to consider when you implement the good async MPI or, uh, API, or let's say that you should consider. Uh, and if you don't want to consider those things, then at least talk about it and say, we know the risk of not introducing a certain thing, but we make explicit decisions in our code. That's usually something I uh, encourage you to do. And the, the, the thing that I'm going to show you with the API that I'm going to show you is an API where I'm trying to basically come up with a method that awaits a task and provides an SLA to that task. So what it, do, it does, it, it, um, it will get a cancellation token, and it will either be cancelled when someone outside cancels uh, that method, or after the SLA of that method that uh, awaits that task has been exceeded. That's what we're going to, uh, to have a look at. And, um, I'm showing you now this this uh, this code. So this is this is the example here. So what we have is we have a cancellation token source and we have an await task delay from one day. Okay. 
So someone gave, gave us a task that will basically wait for one day, and then we add this helper method that I'm going to explain to you that is, in my eyes, a good citizen of an async API. It's called with cancellation. We provide a, cancel, a cancellation token that comes from the cancellation token source. Ignore this method. It's not important for us here. And uh, then we have another one where we say, uh, we want to cancel in two seconds. We are, again have a task delay of one day, and we use the same method. So how would we implement such a, me a method? How, let's have a quick uh, look at what a good async citizen is. So first of all, uh, what we do is we return a task, task of t result, value task or value task of t result. Okay? We're not going to return void. Why not? Correct, yes. So async void is a fire and forget kind of way. As soon as the first await statement is reached in the implementation of this, this method, um, anything that happens afterward is not awaited. So from the caller perspective, it's over. And for example, any exceptions is raised on the background and will pull, the, pull down uh, your up domain. Okay? As soon as you wrap, return a task, a task of t, value task, or value task of re, uh, result, t result, what's going to happen is the compiler will make sure that the task always proper, or the state machine, everything always properly wraps the exception in the task. And in the worst case, if you're not awaiting the task that is returned from this method, it will at least uh, raise the task scheduler unobserved exception uh, event handler that you can catch and make meaningful decisions. Be aware, this exception handler will only be raised uh, when uh, the, the, the GC uh, kicks in, okay? So there is not, it's not like immediately uh, an exception has been thrown, it got catched. It's not immediately the task uh, unobserved exception handler will kick in. It will take a while until the next garbage collection cycle comes, and only then it will raise that, that event, just that you, you know that. Okay, now that we did it, we actually have proper uh, exception semantics and proper uh, expressed intent of this API. What we then do is, we accept the cancellation token. And now, uh, with the latest C-sharp features, you can just say default. You no longer have to say default cancellation token, because .NET provides you the concept of corporative cancellation. Corporative cancellation means when you are accepting a cancellation token, you're kindly requested to implement cancellation where you see fit. What does that mean? Well. Um, you are the implementer and you exactly know what this code is doing and where it's feasible to cancel and where it's not feasible to cancel. Let me give you a concrete example. If you pass a cancellation token to an HTTP client, what it means is if you cancel it, you don't know whether the HTTP call already happened, whether where in the method implementation the call actually was, right? So it could already be that the serialization from the payload that you got from the server already happened, allocations already happened, and after then, basically, the implementation cancels. But that's up to you that implements that method. That would, that's what it means, corporative cancellation. So if you're writing APIs today that you're going to expose to users in terms of frameworks or libraries or whatever, even internally, and you're saying, I don't know yet where I can cancel it, you can still already today put the cancellation token onto that interface or method, but you can choose to ignore it. Okay, That's totally fine. And then you can essentially evolve the implementation over time once you learn more about implementation details that you want to implement and make meaningful decisions where you want to cancel and where you don't want to cancel. But it's always good to do that. Now, because we are saying we want, we have essentially two cases in this method. We want to cancel when this cancellation token is cancelled that got provided by the user, or we want to make sure we have an internal SLA here of 10 seconds. What you then do is you create linked cancellation token sources. A linked cancellation token source is something that is, it creates a cancellation token that is either cancelled when you call cancel on that linked cancellation token, that's the one that is returned here, or when the externally uh, inputted cancellation token is cancelled. So, what we do here, for example, we're saying for our internal SLA for this method, we say cancel after 10 seconds. And now, let me show you the first C-sharp 8 feature. 
when now we have the using statement that we can just slap onto the using var linked uh, token source, and now the compiler will make sure that the scope of this uh, linked token source is properly analyzed and that it in, in injects the proper uh, disposal of that linked uh, token source into the right uh, point into the method so you don't have to worry about it anymore. That's pretty handy. You should always dispose cancellation token sources. Okay, first uh, another rule. Why should you always dispose cancellation token sources? Any guesses? No guesses? Okay. So when we provide cancel after, the cancellation token source internally manages timers. And timers um, are not an infinite resource <laughs> on your system. They, they need to be properly managed uh, by, by the timer pool and everything. And you need to, uh, you need to dispose the cancellation token source uh, when it manages timer. So the nuanced answer to this general rule is when you call cancel after or when you provide uh, when you use the constructor of cancellation token source that accepts a time span, you always have to dis dispose it. Okay. Now, uh, what we want to do is we have a task that we, we got from a user. And now we, what we want to do is we want to make sure that our own code waits either for the output of the user provided task or for our internal SLA. And we want to do that without blocking. So what we can do is we can use the uh, task completion source. And uh, the task completion source is basically a task where we control the output, uh, sorry, the, the state of this task. So we can tell a task completion source, you're now canceled, you're now in exception state, or you are uh, uh, now uh, com completed. When we use a task completion source, and we are on .NET framework uh, 461 and higher, and here we are in .NET Core app, then you should always provide this task creation, op or task creation options, run continuations asynchronously. That's a pretty mouthful. Uh, what it does is, is it changes the behavior of the task completion source when it executes the continuation of your code. What does that mean? So we have here the task completion source that has the task here, down here. And what it does, it says basically normally, if you don't provide this input, what's going to happen is the, the continuation of this code, which is the part here, is going to be executed on the thread that calls try set result, try set canceled, or try set exception. And that behavior can lead to deadlock. Because .NET Framework could make breaking changes, unfortunately. We, uh, they introduced this enum, and it's not the standard behavior, and you have to opt in for that. If you're not on those frameworks yet, and you have task completion sources in your code, do a little bit of homework over the weekend or maybe on Monday morning. Um, go back to your code, search for task completion sources, and um, if, if then wrap the try set result, try set exception, or um, uh, try set cancel with a task.run. Then you get the same behavior uh, when you don't have this enum. When you are in a framework that version that supports that enum, uh, please add that, that enum. Of course, if you're in high performance, high critical code, and you exactly know what this stuff is doing, there might be cases where you're saying, I know it's more efficient to not use that enum, but let's say in many cases, it's probably good to have this enum, okay? And now, if you're a, a good citizen and we write high-performance uh, framework-like code, um, what, we, uh, what we have to do is when we use the cancellation token registrations, cancellation token registrations means is we can attach a delegate to the cancellation token that gets called when the cancellation token goes into the cancel state. Okay, that's the register one. Then again, we need to use, wrap it in a using uh, because it needs to be disposed. And now what we should be doing is um, we should make sure that we don't have um, closure allocations in this code. So ideally, if you can, uh, we use the state-based overload of the register method and then we put the state into the method, which is the task uh, completion source of object, and then we cast the state to the task completion source of object, and then we call try set result. And then the next thing, uh, we already talked a little bit about it, we have to make sure that we uh, opt out from context capturing because we're writing labor, library framework-ish type of code. We use the is, use synchronization context false, okay? 
And then uh, what we can do is, uh, I usually advise people that are new to async await and stuff, don't go into concurrency land from the beginning. What does concurrency land mean, or let's say explicit concurrency land? Usually when you just write await, 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 right, it's sequentially executed. So it's like this line of code, then the next line of code, if there is an exception, the next line of code will not be executed, and then your try catches and everything comes into place. We can opt in for explicit concurrency if we know what we're doing. For example, when all is such a thing, or when any is such a thing, right? But once we start using those kinds of things, we are in the concurrency lands and there are dragons. We all know that, right? So we have to make sure that the code is executed under uh, those concurrency mechanism is essentially uh, threat safe, or uh, let me allow it to say, concurrency safe, right? Because um, it can be executed by the same threat with async await, but it might be concurrently executed. So any shared state, any mutable state that you share in there, um, you're going to have a hard time uh, to, to find the problems that you're going to have in your production system. Okay? And also, when you're not doing explicit concurrency, as you can imagine, it's easier to debug your code, as simple as that. So I usually tell people, go with the normal async await, and only when you have measured and then you know you need to fan out and do concurrency things, go for concurrency. Here, we, ne we need to, because what we want to do is, we want to say, please continue uh, with this code when either the user-provided task is canceled, uh, sorry, is uh, cancelled or, or executed, completed, or when uh, the task completion source that represents the cancellation case of the SLA is completed. And what's pretty handy is when uh, task when any returns a task that represents the task that was completed first. Okay, so here, if the user task is done, we get the user task back. Back. If the task completion source is done, we get the task completion source task back. So now what we can do is we can do um, equal comparison and we can say, okay, in the case where the result task was the task completion source task, we know that we got cancelled, so the SLA is over, so the user provided task took longer than the 10 seconds that we implemented, then we can throw an operation cancelled exception. And what many people don't know is that operation cancelled exception has a constructor overload that allows you to, pro to provide a cancellation token that is indicative of the token that was triggered in the cancellation process. So that's pretty handy. So you pass it in here. That is also something that I would call a good citizen. And then, of course, we have await task uh, configure, configure await false. Again, the, the, the questions that you should be asking yourself should be, am I framework or library code? Yes. Do I, do I need, then probably most of the time the answer is, I'm going to write configure await false. Um, and then another question is, do I need um, access to uh, environmental context aware stuff? Um, and if the answer is no, then also write configure wait false. If the answer is yes, for example, in WPF, WinForms, when you need to access um, uh, elements uh, from the on the UI thread, then you probably don't want to write configure uh, configure await false, then the, the default is configure await uh, true. So that's what I would say uh, is a proper good async citizen that hopefully gives you a good example of all the things that you should think about when you're writing a good uh, and highly performant async, uh, async code. Good, good. Let me quickly uh, execute this. <coughs> Just that you see. So in the first case, um, the SLA kicks in. After 10 seconds, this method will be cancelled. In the second example, just a quick reminder, I set it uh, the cancellation from the outside to one second, and then um, uh, it's 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 cancelled. So the total execution time of this method is roughly uh, uh, 12 seconds. Cool. And yeah, I forgot to mention one little thing. Uh, <laughs> what I usually, uh, what I also hear is sometimes, yeah, but. Um, Async await doesn't make my DB queries faster. It's like, yeah, that's true. Like, <laughs> what do you expect? It's no silver bullet, right? If, you're, if your DB query takes two seconds, even if you're going to use async await, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use two seconds. The only difference that you have, but it's a good difference to have, is that the thread that is executing that query is not blocked for the two seconds. So it can do concurrently uh, hundreds, uh, thousands, uh, multiple thousands of other operations, which is in 
in, on your servers, in the cloud, and, and everywhere, it's much more efficient because you can get in higher uh, saturations of your resources that you have available on the servers, okay? Cool. So let's have another look. What I then sometimes hear is, especially uh, with performance-related discussions, is, um, <clears throat> well, um, I know I've heard that uh, I can shortcut the state machine. Hmm? Uh, by not, use, not using the async await keywords. And I say, yeah, that's true. Let me explain that to you. So normally you would write this, right? You write uh, does not, uh, the method does not shortcut state machine. You write task completion source, blah, 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 await task delay, some async stuff. Uh, give it, uh, give it um, uh, something, and then I execute this. So this method will generate state machine stuff under the hood, and the state machine has uh, fields and uh, closures and crappy things that use memory, right? So if you, if you execute this code hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of times concurrently, it might be more efficient to do this. So instead of writing the async await keyword, you just return the task. You can do that if the method has one exit point of a task, right? It's the, the exit point is the, the last one, the return, or if you have two exit points. For example, if you have an if condition return, else return, then you can do this kind of uh, optimization. What then happens is if we execute this code, um, the first version <coughs> has a frame count, a stack frame count of 32. And the async method builder um, uh, is set to true and does not does shortcut has a frame count of uh, 19 frames. So we we are saving um, a, a bit a bit of space. And as we can, uh, but I usually tell people in most of most of the cases I would not encourage to go down that path. Why would I not encourage to go down that path? One problem this code has it's harder to evolve. Because once we start returning tasks, when we wrap, for example, this code in using statements, and we're not aware of the behavior, what's going to happen is the task is, re uh, the task is returned, and immediately the using statement uh, uh, disposes the resource that we're wrapping around that task. So if the method that wants to access that disposable resource is executed, the disposable resource is already disposed, even though the method has not executed right yet. And those kind of hard problems to find, you can avoid it when you always stick to the async await keywords. One other good thing is when you have the async await keywords is you get more compiler warnings if you forget to await a method that returns a task and the compiler tells you, hey, look at this code, I found a task. I think most of the time it's probably good if you await it. Do you really do not want to await it? And then you can say, yes, I know what I'm doing. I don't want to wait it. And then you can ignore the compiler warning. Um, one other good thing uh, that the async await keyword has is when you add it, you do not get surprises. What are surprises? Uh, let me show you this method here. Uh, the surprise method returns a task and throws an invalid operation exception. And uh, the, upper, uh, the upper layer code, what it does is it says, Surprise, it calls the method which returns a task and it adds an ignore method. The ignore method, what it, what it internally does, let me show you quickly. Um, it does a try, await, um, task, uh, configure, configure, await, catch, any kinds of exceptions. The problem is that, oh, sorry. The problem is when you're writing, sorry. Uh, when you're writing that kind of code, the exception is, is thrown on the synchronous path, so it's not really wrapped in a task, it's directly bubbled up to the caller. So any kind of uh, await uh, statements and stuff does not re really ki kick in. So, um, it's, so this, uh, if I would wrap this with a proper try-catch, which I did here, um, the, 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 it's, it's, the method is not executed, so the exception bubbles directly up on the call stack on this on this method uh, method level that's another thing that that um, is a bit tricky and one of the things that the .NET Framework team did is they realized um, 
they want to make the situation for you better when you stick to this async await keyword. And what they did is in .NET Core, in many versions, they actually, already in .NET Core 2.2, they started optimizing those scenarios. So what you can see is previously here, uh, it's, it used uh, 488 bytes when you await it. And now with the newer versions uh, with .NET Core 3.0, it uses 456 bytes. So Microsoft is continuously optimizing also the state machine code that gets generated for you. So in most of the cases for your code, I suggest you for safety reasons, stick to the async await keyword only if you know what you're doing. If you have uh, profiled it, then opt out from the keywords and return the task directly. Okay? Cool. Um, and another thing that uh, gave us a lot of headache is that whenever we got support requests from customers, we got lock for net seri lock statements that were like, I don't know, 10 pages long, right? Because of the async state machine created stacked traces from hell, right? Multiple, uh, uh, like, pages of stack trace. And now with the .NET Core, with the newer .NET Core versions, what you get is you get better stack traces. So now all the async state machinery is, is removed from, from the stack trace when an exception is thrown. We can see here we have a six level deep stack trace. And with the uh, newer .NET Core versions, it was introduced in .NET Core 2.1, and later we now have finally readable stack traces, which is a good, a really good thing. And now also when you're analyzing your log files, you no longer have to scroll through pages and pages of stack traces. Now the stack trace is almost as good as before. Or let's say it is as good as, as before. Okay, <clears throat> cool. So let's d d dig a little bit deeper into some of the, uh, some of the other nifty features that, that we get. Um, we now have async disposable. So with C-sharp 8, um, .NET Core, uh, we can now use async disposable. So one of the problems the community had is when you implement this iDisposable interface, iDisposable returns void. If you need to dispose in the dispose method something uh, that is async or you need to execute async code to clean up resources to closing uh, connections asynchronously, you, the only choice you have is you either do async void, which is evil, that we talked about, right? Or you do the get away to get result stuff, which is sync over async, which is also evil, okay? So now, finally, we have something. Uh, we have the async disposable. And um, um, here, I'm showing you this. Um, so the normal disposable, we had to call get away to get result if you wanted to, for example, flush a stream asynchronously. And now with the new async disposable, we can return this async disposable interface. And then what it does, it returns a value task. Uh, the benefit of the value task is it's a basically a discriminated union of a, of a task um, that only gets allocated on demand if, we really, if we're really on an asynchronous path. If we're completing synchronously, which we can here, there is no allocations. Um, which is a really, uh, really nifty, nifty uh, thing that they introduced. So now, if we implement this iAsync disposable, we can properly, for example, flush async and this, the stream, um, uh, dispose async the streams uh, if we have it, or any other async kind of operation we can execute here. The syntax is a little bit awkward. Um, uh, what we can, what we have to write here is we write await using. And then we knew up our uh, correct disposable that wants to dispose async resources that implements iAsync disposable. Only when we implement iAsync disposable, we can write the await keyword in front of the using. So the compiler makes sure that, that this is uh, properly uh, implemented. And then, of course, we have to write somewhere configure await false. Um, so we have to write it, it's a bit awkward, after new correct disposable write dot configure await false. Why do we have to write it here? Any guesses? What is a using statement? Or let's say, how is the use, what implements the using statements? If you would express this with regular C sharp code. Try finally, exactly. Who writes the try finally? The compiler, right? Okay. So, but the code is written by the compiler, and I need to influence the code. Which code do I need to influence? Uh, influence. Remember, try finally. Inside the final block, we do await something async. 
the continuation of this code is whatever comes after the final block is done, which is the code, so to speak, after this curly brace. <laughs> okay? So, but the code is written by the compiler. And that's why we need to tell it here, hey, please, when you write the code that's with the try finally and you execute whatever is in the iAsync disposable after you call dispose, await dispose async of the implementation of iAsync disposable, please disable the context capturing for that code. Okay? And of course, you can, um, you can implement both interfaces. You can implement iAsync disposable and iDisposable. You can do that. But the compiler, so the compiler generated code uh, will only execute, as you can see here, the dispose async. So if you write await using, it will only call uh, the, the dispose async. Only if you then remove the await from the using, it will actually call the dispose method of the iDisposable. So don't implement both because we return a value task on the interface. It's totally valid to only do synchronous work in the dispose async and you will not be hurt um, by the allocations of the task because the value task already has that case basically internalized where you can synchronously uh, execute stuff and you don't, get, uh, you, you're, you don't have the allocation uh, problem. Cool. Um, let's, the timer is gone. How much? Ah, five minutes. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> now let's have a look at an, another feature of uh, C-Sharp 8. We are now getting um, async streams. Um, async streams is, I think, for me personally, with async, it's one of the coolest features because it enables so many super nice scenarios. Let me show you that. So what we have here is um, we have a method, uh, read delays, and it returns an iAsync enumerable. Let's have a quick look. And what we can do here when we return async enumerable, we can now finally write yield return and yield break. Previously, we couldn't do that in a body that uh, executed async operations. Now we can. So I'm showing you here something like I'm reading a file, I'm opening up a stream reader, and inside that file, I have milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, um, and so on. I read it, and what I do is I read every line asynchronously from that file, from the, from the file stream, and then I yield the return those milliseconds converted into an int. So what's going to happen, the compiler sta creates a state machine that is uh, async enabled and we can use yield return to continuously stream results that are coming from that file to the caller that calls us. And um, by doing so, we essentially can um, uh, have a wait for each and for every milliseconds that we get, we can write another async code. So if we execute this one, what's going to happen is we're continuously getting milliseconds from the file, and as you can see, this, this code basically continuously slows down while it's for reaching. And because it's async enabled, the state machine that, that's uh, generated, we can also um, pass in uh, cancellation tokens, and then um, the compiler is going to do uh, a little bit of magic. I'm going to explain this briefly. So when we put in the cancellation uh, token, um, we can also call with cancellation uh, with, with a token source. What with cancellation does is when the compiler gets the ASIC enumerator uh, from the code that is generated, it essentially provides the token that you passed in the with cancellation extension method um, uh, to, that, to that get async enum enumerator call. If you don't call it, then uh, it will pass in the, the default cancellation token, which is uh, basically an empty, an empty struct. Again, if we use uh, the, the a wait for each, we have to do configure wait false. Quick reminder, a for each loop is nothing else than a while loop, basically, right? It gets turned into a while loop, a loop with state machine. So also here, the compiler creates code for us, and we need to tell it, I want to opt out from context capturing uh, because I don't, don't uh, need it. And then we can properly cancel. So for example, as you can see here, I canceled after 3,200 uh, milliseconds. Or if I cancel this, the other one, after 2,400 uh, milliseconds, it will also cancel. I'm not going to show this because this takes too, 
too much time, but this is enabled by passing this enumerator cancellation attribute. What the enumerator cancellation attribute does, it, the comp it tells the compiler to create the combined cancellation token source out of the two tokens. So one, one is the one that I uh, pass into this method, and the other one is the one that I passed with cancellation. Okay? And why is this useful? Well, uh, let me show you a real-world example uh, without going uh, much more into the details of uh, the, the wait for each because of uh, timing reasons. Uh, what we can write is, we, for example, um, we need to parse for, for a project that we're doing, we need to parse NuGet metadata from, from the NuGet APIs in, in order to download packages. So what you can do is you can combine the streaming nature with the async concurrency nature and uh, cr create really, really cool code. So for example, what you can do is uh, with, um, you can lock down the concurrency in, in, in the yield code as well. You return an async enumerable. You're saying, I'm going to use a semaphore to lock down the concurrency. You spin off all the get metadata uh, calls to the NuGet server per page. So let's say we get a, a thousand uh, NuGet packages uh, from the server. We spin off, and this code does nothing more than just HTTP client get to that package, downloads the metadata, and it limits the concurrency because we, we pass in the throttler uh, to maximum 10 calls. So we only do 10 calls concurrently so that we don't overwhelm the NuGet server. And now what we can do is we can uh, use a while loop here, and we can say, well, do wait for any of the tasks in this list to be completed, and once you have it, remove it from the list of currently executing tasks and yield return it. And what that means is, for example, we spin off max 10 HTTP client calls to the, to the NuGet server, and if five of those happen to be completed in, let's say, a second, we, all, we return five calls that are already completed to the caller. So basically, the outer caller doesn't have to wait anymore for the, for the package to be downloaded. They can just like, get all the metadata five, and then we wait again. Maybe 10 are concurrently executed and done, and then we immediately get uh, 10 other NuGet packages. What this means is when we are building, for example, a client experience that needs to visualize the metadata from the NuGet servers, they continuously stream as they're done into the, the, the client code. And I can briefly, hopefully the internet works. I can briefly execute this on my machine. And then you can see, I'm reading, and you can see as the metadata is basically done uh, within the concurrency constraints that I'm providing, the, the metadata packages are continuously flowing, flowing into the console. And this is done by just leveraging here, as you can see, the magic of a wait for each, read metadata packages, and we get as many as we, as, as we are that are concurrently completed. Okay, so in any case, um, I have much more information and much more details also about uh, the for each. If you're interested uh, to hear more, uh, you can go to github.com slash Marbach slash async.net core. There are also many more samples, pipeline, channels, and other things, um, because normally this presentation would run for two hours. Um, you can, there is also a readme in there uh, with all the explanations that I gave you, should anything be, be too quick for you. Uh, if you have other questions, if you're going home, sitting in, in the train, or I don't know, public transportation, oh, Daniel didn't talk about this one, I have here business cards on this side and on this side of the stage. Feel free to grab a business card, send me emails uh, over the weekend or next week or whenever you're ready, and I will uh, kindly answer them. Of course, I'm also still here until maybe 5, 6 p.m. If you have any other async questions, feel free to shoot them at me. Thank you very much. Daniel Marbach, ladies and gentlemen.